and welcome to this year's Christmas Political Game Show. My name is Nancy Masiska and I'm delighted to be your Reindeer Antlered host. So first of all, I hope that you'll play along with us in this Winterville Trigger Warning Christmas special. Firstly, I'd like to introduce our special guests joining the volunteers. First, we have Luke Gitos. He is a solicitor practicing criminal law and legal editor for the online magazine Spiked. Next, we have Ella Whelan. She is a staff writer for Spiked and freelance journalist for The Spectator. In honor of the upcoming Star Wars film, <laughs> we've decided to name our teams the Stormtroopers and the Princesses. So if we're ready, we've got eight fast-paced rounds to go. Starting off with round one, now I have here a box of delightful Christmas presents because Christmas is a time for receiving and each item <laughs> relates to a news story that was in the press in 2015. I would like our teams to work out what news story it was and just explain it for our viewers. First one, it's a little pig. <laughs> Stormtroopers. Uh, I, I think this is our dear leader who was exposed, or he exposed himself, to the mouth of an unwilling dead pig. Is it that story? Piggate. This refers to the uncorroborated anecdote that during his university years, British Prime Minister David Cameron put a private part of his anatomy into a dead pig's mouth as part of an initiation ceremony for the Piers Gaveston Society. Second gift is... Labour's election mug. It says, controls on immigration. I'm voting Labour, 7th of May. Is this the people not voting Labour on the 7th of May? Is that the story? <laughs> this is Muggate, uh, which refers to the pledge mug that Labour was selling in the run-up to the 2015 general election, saying, as I just said before, controls on immigration. I'm voting Labour. So it's Labour apparently showing its anti-immigration true colours. Now we have... Marissa? Okay, so this is related to the serial killer cafe, right? Attack oh, in Shoreditch. Yeah. Early this year, where there was loads of protesters uh, targeting this specific cafe. So yeah, as Marissa said, it referred to the attack on serial killer cafe on Brick Lane. Class war, or class war if you're from the south, <laughs> were the anarchist group behind the protest, and they stormed the cafe to protest against the so-called gentrification of the area. They, of course, think that they represent the poor who have no aspirations and prefer fair poor establishments in the neighbourhood. What do we have here? I feel like it was that side a little bit more, the princesses. Was, was this the attempt to ban vaping in, in more and more spaces? Um, yeah, for the war on e-cigarettes, which despite all evidence showing that they're better than harmless and encourage thousands of people to smoke, to not smoke. <laughs> <laughs> from 2017, people in Wales will be banned from using e-cigarettes in enclosed places like restaurants, pubs, as you said, and at work under new public health law. Don't want to break it. We have a train. <laughs> Women only train carriages. Yes! <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn suggested we should have women only rail carriages because um, he believes that it would help to stem the rise in sexual assaults on women on public transport because obviously women are so vulnerable they can't, you know, sit in a mixed carriage. And on to our last one, we have. Oh. <laughs> This um, was the ban that came in this year on plastic bags and, and there's a five free charge for mm -hmm. any bag in supermarkets. This is of course seen as another behaviour modification tax law to limit our mm -hmm. consumption because, you know, of course we need controlling as we're nasty, evil, planet-destroying human beings. <laughs> Merry Christmas! <laughs> our second round is racial microaggressions in everyday life. So for this round, we'll consider microaggressions, but first, an extra point for the team with the best explanation for what racial microaggressions are. To enter, you need to blow on your saucy lips. <laughs> <laughs> saucy. I'll go with that time. Really, really small aggressions. <laughs> Is it being aggressive without realising that you're being aggressive? Subtle, everyday aggressions such as perhaps calling somebody by the wrong pronoun. Uh, microaggressions are the everyday verbal, non-verbal and environmental slights, snubs or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory or negative messages to target persons based solely upon their marginalised group membership. 
It is believed that most well-intentioned white people have inherited the racial biases of their forebears, <laughs> that the most harmful forms remain outside the level of conscious awareness, and that making the invisible visible is the first step to overcoming these hideous hidden prejudices. Now, I'll read out some examples of common microaggressions, and you guys need to blow on your saucy lips if you know what they are. Where are you from? <laughs> Princesses. Are you suggesting I'm a foreigner? Exactly it. Second one. There is only one race, the human race. Stormtroopers. Oh, by saying there's only one race, you're sort of denying that other races have it harder and that they're treated differently because they're of a different race. Yeah, it's it denies the individual's racial and ethnic experience and suggests that they have to assimilate or acculturate to the dominant culture. Third one. I believe the most qualified person should get the job. <laughs> Again, stormtroopers. That's suggesting that what job should you get on the basis of merit and achievement rather than actually giving women um, a bigger hand up, which is what you really should do. <laughs> 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 Point for that. Point for that. Okay, the fourth one. If you say to a black person, why do you have to be so loud and animated? Stereotyping that um, somebody because you prefer them as black. Is it that um, you're stereotyping black people as being more bubbly, loud and aggressive in their social interactions? Yeah, I'll give you that. So our fifth one, saying, you are so articulate, or asking an Asian person to help with a maths or science problem. It's to say that all Asian people work in IT related something. <laughs> so they are the call centres of the world and so they would know how to solve your problem. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that stereotype that all, like that stereotype that all Asians are like intelligent and good at maths and science. Okay, and our sixth final one: if you say to a disabled person, "Let me do that for you," Ella? you really shouldn't help someone who can't do something because it might make them feel bad and it's being disabledist. Different disabledist. <laughs> our next round is who said it? I think that gay marriage is something that should be between a man and a woman. Pressure ejaculation. Boris Johnson. No. Oh, Donald Trump. No. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes. Oh. Next one. Terms are like shredded wheat. Two are wonderful. Three might be too many. Oh, this is David Cameron. Yes, it yeah. is. After hearing President Obama had had breakfast with the leaders of the UK, China, and Russia, who said, "Can you tell the difference between them?" <laughs> Yes, mm. correct. Well, firstly, there was one fully black person. There was another one of our leading spokesmen who was half black, and that didn't get a mention. <laughs> Fraser? Is it Farage? Yeah. After meeting the Nigerian president, who was wearing his traditional robes, you look like you're ready for bed. <laughs> oh. Sure, Prince, Prince Philip again. Yes. Wow. The trouble with girls in labs is that they cry when criticised and fall in love with male counterparts. That was uh, Tim Hunt. Oh, yeah, no, correct. No, no, yes. On to round four, and this round is on university bans, and we'll consider ten things that have been banned or bans that have been called for across university campuses. Each team will have five to figure out. So for the stormtroopers, the five bans are clapping, spelling and grammar corrections, Holocaust commemoration, Condemning the terrorist group ISIS and sombreros. For the princesses, you have men and white students, yoga classes, No Offence magazine, the men's rugby club at the London School of Economics, and Julie Bindle. So, first of all, I'm going to start with the stormtroopers. Can you tell me about clapping? Okay, so clapping um, was asked to be banned at a meeting in which um, some people in the meeting, and it was a safe space, felt that clapping was triggering um, feelings in them and they felt unsafe. They used jazz hands instead. There you go. Yeah. All snapping fingers. That's it. The National Union of Students Women's Campaign claimed that the act of clapping could trigger some people's anxiety and therefore should be banned from all of the conferences. Instead, the feminist students instructed those who attended conferences to use jazz hands to wave, the, to wave your hands silently in the air. So, um, spelling and grammar corrections. Ableism. 
people with different um, ideas cultural spelling. ideas cultural of spelling. Ideas. And then there was wasn't there an American university that um, almost sacked a professor because someone spelled indigenous with a capital letter and they corrected it to have a small i and then he was told that this was unacceptable. Yeah, yeah, that's it. The students at the University of California in Los Angeles claimed that the grammar and spelling corrections made by a UCLA professor were creating an unsafe climate for students of colour. They <laughs> argued that the professor's corrections were a form of microaggression against the students and were themselves incorrect because they were perceived grammatical choices that in actuality reflect ideologies. And corrections aren't allowed to be in red pen, are they? Yeah, hell yeah. that as well now. Yeah. The main, it's far too aggressive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, the third one, Holocaust commemoration. There's a worry that the Holocaust gets way too much attention as like the bad thing and lots of other bad things have happened in the past to other races of people and we should commemorate those as well. Yeah, you touched on some, some points that are highlighted in here. I've got here, the students at the University of Goldsmiths voted against commemorating the Holocaust because it was too Eurocentric. <laughs> right, the fourth one, condemning the terrorist group ISIS. So this has happened at a number of universities and um, by openly condemning ISIS and having speakers that talk about what ISIS is about, it can be construed as an act of Islamophobia because it isolates um, the Muslim students because they might feel that they are somehow linked to ISIS. Yeah, yeah that's it. Point for that. And finally, sombreros. I, I think this story is about the University of East Anglia recently banned a Mexican restaurant from giving out sombreros at a freshers' fair, saying that that was essentially racist, not representative of a culture. Mm -hmm. The students' union claimed that the hats which were given out by a Mexican restaurant breached their rules on discriminatory or stereotypical language. The union ordered the restaurant to stop giving them away and told students caught wearing them to take them off immediately. <laughs> Princesses, men and white students, why was that banned? Um, it was related to Golden F, so the diversity officer, I think, banned all men and white students from attending a meeting. Um, because they weren't safe. Yeah, ensure the safe, to ensure the space was safe enough for those who had been historically oppressed by white people. Uh, student Union Welfare and Diversity Officer at Goldsmiths University, Baha Mustafa, asked men and white people not to attend a meeting about diversity and then defended her actions by saying she's not racist as she's from an ethnic minority. <laughs> <laughs> Second, yoga classes. Well, we, we thought that this was uh, a classic example of cultural appropriation. Yeah, when you, which is a microaggression, really. It, absolutely. And, um, or uh, a Mac fee aggression. It's, yeah, it's, it's a huge yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we thought it was um, our, they thought it was outrageous that uh, people in the West would take a cultural practice from India and uh, use it for their own awful ends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Third one. No offense, magazine. It was from Oxford University, um, I think. Mm -hmm. They banned it from the student freshers. The men's rugby club at the London School of Economics. Well, this because this was because they used quite a lot of rather misogynistic material to advertise their also similarly misogynistic club nights. So uh -huh. and they called women slugs, you know, and can't handle it. You can't handle the word slug. Also objectifying the men in their small shorts running around the field. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't want to objectify them. Yeah, the university sports team was suspended from playing after calling female students, as you said, slags and mingers in a leaflet handed out at a refreshers fair. Because obviously if you say words like slags and mingers, you shouldn't be allowed to play games. The final one, Julie Bindle. Um, this was about her comments. Uh, because She was banned because she said something about uh, transsexuals and so they were like, she might upset um, their gender neutral I don't know, what policy? Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, you're touching on it, yeah. The, the radical feminist Julie Binder was banned from speaking at the Society at the University of Manchester due to her views and comments on trans people. The students believe that Bindle's presence could incite hatred towards and the exclusion of trans students.
Moving on to our fifth round, which is gendered toys. So it's the holiday season and trigger warning, Christmas is a time of year when many families are shopping around for new presents for the kids. Based on very serious scientific evidence, the aim of this round is to test your knowledge on what is an inappropriate gendered toy for a young child. I love a good sex, I mean gendered toy. <laughs> if you think that you have the answer, I want you to jazz hands, practice. It's very glamorous, it's like the West End. So the first one, why is giving girls a Barbie doll a major problem? Straight in there. Um, because Barbies can be seen as role models for girls and it's been scientifically proven that their bodies are extremely disproportionate if they were sized up to normal human size and it's giving young girls an unrealistic vision of what women should be. Right here's that. Girls who play with Barbies might think that they could do fewer jobs in the future and playing with them could turn them into passive princesses. What traits do playing with kitchen and cookery toys dangerously reinforce in girls? Right in there, stormtroopers. Um, buying your little gal a sewing kit or a cooking kit, or as I once got from Santa's Grotto, a dustpan and pink dustpan. <laughs> <laughs> My car! <laughs> means that you Just are not. saying to them that their place will always be in the home. What impact does Action Man toys have on boys? <laughs> Princesses. Does it encourage them to be too masculine? Violent, I'm saying. Perhaps yeah. encourage body dysmorphia because all the action men are quite ripped with, um, you know, lots of yeah. muscles and things like that. It could lead to, you know, violent behaviour. I've also got here militarism, gang culture and homophobia. That included here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fourth one. Why should we not dress young girls in pink and young boys in blue? I think there was an idea that dressing your child in either pink or blue would make assumptions about what gender they would choose in due course. So, always be safe and dress your children in plain clothes. <laughs> 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 Obviously, leaving babies dressed in pink with hideously unequal chances in life. Okay, now moving on to round six, which is titled Benevolent Sexism. All right, now first of all, I will give two points to the team, which can explain with their party poppers. Enter if you think you know the answer. What does benevolent sexism mean? Stormtroopers. It's sort of similar to a microaggression. It's uh, subconscious sexism, so um, making assumptions about women uh, that you hold subconsciously rather than actively being sexist. US researchers argue that men who are guilty of benevolent sexism see women as incompetent beings who require their cherished protection. So you're going to have a minute to write down five examples of benevolent sexism, starting from now. <laughs> Time's up. We'll start with the princesses. Can you give me your five, five examples? Opening uh, the door for a woman, for example, uh, paying the bills, or so offering to carry women's mm -hmm. shopping, heavy bags. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, offering a, a, a coat if they're cold. When, when they're cold. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. oh, offering a seat on the bus um, and not allowing women to drive. All right, and then on to the stormtroopers. Okay, well, we had some snatched from us um, through eavesdropping. Right, <laughs> right. The right. ones that we have include uh, DIY, so when men do things around the house because they think that women can't manage to change light bulbs, or um, as a case I saw in Sussex, so complimenting is also a benevolent sexist. A woman was extremely upset um, when the postman said that she had beautiful feet, and she thought that was extremely sexist. Beautiful feet! You should have yeah. called her a minger or a slag. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to carrying shopping, things to do with strength, um, picking up heavy boxes, not with women not being as strong as men. Yeah, I've just got a list of ten, we've got, as some of you said, holding a door open for a woman, smiling, calling a woman love or dear, refusing to split the bill, uh, offering a woman their jacket if they look cold, saying that men should make sacrifices to provide for women, helping uh, ladies choose the right computer or carry their shopping, for example, <laughs> <laughs> referring to a group of men and women as guys, uh, offering to do the driving on a long journey instead of a female partner, calling women girls but not referring to men as boys, and when men say they cannot live without a woman or how much they cherish women. Next round is called consent. Do you get it? So for this round, we're talking about consent and sexual relations. And as many of our viewers may know, consent classes are now mandatory in universities because apparently men don't understand what it means. And university life has become excessively dangerous for girls. So according to Alison Saunders, the director of public prosecutions, consent is only consent if it is loud and clear and beautiful and enthusiastic. So in this round, we will find out what good consent should look like. So what will happen is I'm going to read out a story. 
while the passage is being read, whenever either team member thinks that they believe consent is required at that moment, you must blow on your festive Christmas whistle things. So for viewers at home, you know, it's a little saucy stories coming up now, maybe a bit of smooth jazz in the background. <laughs> <laughs> right, so a first story. Jay met Lara at a club. No. <laughs> okay. He bought her a drink and they danced... Stormtroopers? No, I didn't want to drink. Maybe he should, he should have asked. Yeah. yeah, he's trying to get her drunk yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have to assume no, the worst in these situations, <laughs> yeah. you know? Okay, yeah. That's been really safe. And they danced all night long. No. <laughs> <laughs> he was excited as this was his first real date. At closing time, Jay held Lara's hand and he took her back to his... You guys? You should ask permission to make physical contact. Yeah, there you go. And he took her back to his place. When they got there, when they got there. <laughs> no, that's not noted down here. So when they got there, Jay began to kiss Lara. What? It's totally unacceptable to kiss someone without asking consent. Mm -hmm, got that noted right here. So he began to kiss Lara whilst they stumbled towards his bedroom. Princesses? They stumbled implying that they weren't um, sober and therefore non incapable to make a decision. And he then moved his hands, oh god, this is so Fifty Shades. <laughs> he then moved his hands to fumble with her bra straps. <laughs> Princesses? You should have asked her um, if he could fumble her. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the kids are calling it these days. <laughs> yeah, point for that, but couldn't work it out. He then moved his hand towards her thigh. Princesses. He should have asked to move his hand further down her leg. Before. Right, yeah. Are you enjoying story time with Nancy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, second story. It's James and Mercedes' third date. Mercedes is flirting, and as James places his hand on Mercedes' knee... <laughs> princesses, yeah? You can't place a hand on me without asking. He's pretty sure that tonight will be the night they go all the way. Assuming that somebody is in agreement with how far you want to go. So, after sharing a pizza and hugging each other on the sofa, Princess is in there. Um, you can't hug. And she, he shouldn't have given her pizza if she might have been gluten free. <laughs> <laughs> Let's assume they've been through dietary requirements. This is the third date now. So, after sharing a pizza and hugging each other on the sofa, he starts to undress her. Whoa! Massive asking for consent. You cannot undress someone without asking explicit consent. On to our final story. It's featuring Zach and Anita. Zach and Anita have been together for a few months and they've had sex lots of times. Anita is staying over at Zach's one evening but heads to bed early. Zach joins her later but Anita is already asleep. <laughs> Ask permission to get into the bed. bed. Yeah. Really? Yeah. God. But she's asleep, that's a bit cruel. <laughs> <laughs> he starts to stroke her hair. But she shrugs him off sleepily, princesses. Didn't ask to stroke the hair either. Mm -hmm. Even though she's unconscious. She's a bit. Her up. Can, I, can I pet your hair? <laughs> <laughs> Zach then kisses her back and puts his hand on her bottom. <laughs> Clearly, Zach should have asked for her permission to stroke her back and, you know, definitely asked for permission to even go anywhere near her bottom. And I think you should have given her a good shove to wake her up. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe some coffee, just to make damn sure that she's awake and she knows what's going on. Yeah. And then said the words, can I go anywhere near <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel? Yeah, then you'd have to sort of ask her permission to wake her up as well, because you shouldn't be touching her Indeed, to wake her. You'd annoyed. have to shout mm. really loud <laughs> in her ear. <laughs> on to our final round. Everything to play for. I'm going to hand out pictures for the picture round now for you to all look at. And our viewers at home, you'll be able to see them on the screen. Each of the pictures relate to a specific news story which involves censorship. So you need to blow on your Christmas horn if you know what the story behind it is. Picture number one. So Jermaine Greer, I think, was banned from speaking at the University of Cardiff mm -hmm. because of her views on transgender. Yeah, 
she was told that she wasn't allowed to give her talk and that she would be, she'd have things thrown at her for her views. Yeah, got it in one. A petition was launched to try and stop her from giving a lecture at Cardiff University because of her beliefs about transgender people. She said that transgender women are not women. Picture number two. Yeah. Come yeah. on. <laughs> okay, this is uh, the comedian Dapper Loves. He's also known as Stephen O'Reilly, personal friend of mine. But he was also banned from the University of Cardiff um, because of a show that he did in which he made reference to a rape joke. Um, and his, his famous words, she knows, is a trigger warning and, and what's linked to consent in that. Actually, he doesn't know that women know, but he assumes that he does. <laughs> so he was banned from speaking on the basis that he would violate the safe space and make all the women in the room feel like they could be potentially raped by this very small, unfunny comedian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is it. Third picture right in there, princesses. We, we think that's Mesa Gifford, who was banned from speaking about his experience fighting ISIS. Yeah, that's it. Got him one. Fourth picture. Is he the uh, Twitter joker? Yes. Mr. Oh. Ch Chambers? Yeah, Paul yeah. Chambers. And um, what, what did he tweet about, which got him in a lot of trouble? He was so annoyed with his local airport that he tweeted that he was going to blow it up. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> 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 yeah, let's face it, we've all shared similar sentiments. <laughs> <laughs> and this, uh, he was arrested, prosecuted, convicted, but subsequently had his conviction quashed eventually. So common sense won out in the end, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, he went through it all. He was actually ended up getting fined a thousand pounds. Our fifth picture. Who is this person? This is um, Spike's editor, Brendan O'Neill, mm -hmm. who's due to have a debate with um, another journalist called Tim Stanley on abortion. And um, Brendan was going to argue for pro-choice side of the argument. But yet the debate was cancelled at Oxford because um, two people without uteruses or wounds cannot make decisions or debate on abortion because they have no material knowledge of what it is to be a woman and own or have a womb. You try. On to our final picture. <laughs> that is Charlotte Proudman, who uh, outed her solicitor colleague for sending, or they didn't work in the same place, but um, he got in contact with her to say how stunning her profile picture was. Mm -hmm. On LinkedIn. And, um, on LinkedIn yeah. She published it on um, her Twitter, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, called it an example of how rampantly sexist the legal profession is. Yes, okay, so we've come to the end of our Christmas political game show. Oh. First of all, so at the end of all those eight rounds, our final scores are. Princesses have 33 points. The Stormtroopers, 34. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> there we go. Now I would like to present the political game show trophy to the Stormtroopers. Congratulations. Well done. Commiserations to the princesses. Good effort. Now that's all we've got time for. I'd like to thank um, all our special guests, Luke and Ella, for joining us, our volunteers and the crew. I hope you have a very merry trigger warning Christmas and a happy <laughs> new year. And if you'd like to take part in the next game show, email us. Cheers! Cheers!